India protests Europe's domination at the International Monetary Fund even as the French Finance Minister Christine Lagarde confirms her candidacy for the top job. When Mohan Singh, our Prime Minister, says struggle to reform global financial institutions is proving to be a long one. Deutsche Bank will actually rename Anshu Jain a co-CEO under a new arrangement. The Financial Times report says the second CEO needn't be a banker and the bank could rope in Deutsche Bank's chief for the top job. In India, markets ended the day with sharp losses. Both Sensex and the Nifty lost a percent each. GMR plans a billion dollar hospital project in the surplus airport land in Hyderabad. The company is in talks with Apollo Hospitals and Mayo Clinic for its healthcare foray. Potential new land acquisition norms could be a blow to developers. Apart from hefty compensation for farmers, developers will have to shell out benefits for farmers in the long term. And Apple's iPhone 4 will be available in India this weekend. Bharti Airtel and Aircel today said they'll start selling that product from the 27th of May. Hello and welcome. You're watching Business Tonight. I'm Shelly Chopra. I'm Sandeep Gurumurthy and you're watching India's number one business news channel. As always, we've got a market report up here on the show. Aisha Faridi with all the analysis of the trade on the last week and Karina Huber with the action on Wall Street. Well, clearly selling intensity remains high with the Nifty breaking below the 53.50 mark. More importantly, it's the IT index which is now broken to a new low. I'll be back in a bit and walk you through how trade panned out. U.S. markets open in the red this morning on disappointing durable goods data. How are the markets reacting later in the trading day? I'll fill you in. See you next. And four early wickets have pegged Kolkata Knight Riders back in the Eliminator against Mumbai. It's our big exclusive. Sahara's 470 million pound upmarket Grovena Hotel Buy in central London is now being probed by the Enforcement Directorate. And it's not Sahara India in trouble alone. Access Bank is also under the lens of the Enforcement Directorate. That's right. The ED is questioning the bank since it remitted the funds for this deal. So what are the charges against Sahara and Access Bank in what looks to be an over 3,000 crore rupee buyout of a famous hotel, Grovna Hotel in London? That's our big story tonight. So Brother Roy checked into London's high-end Grosvenor Hotel in December last year. But the stay hasn't been cosy. His £470 million buy is now under the Enforcement Directorate scanner. ED alleges that Sahara Group violated the FEMA regulations by remitting the entire money under the automatic route. Now according to regulations, Sahara India Real Estate Corporation Limited is being investigated upon by SEBI and RBI. And so it cannot tap the automatic route to remit funds overseas. Sahara India Real Estate invested 470 million pounds or 3,525 crore rupees in Ambi Valley Limited in Mauritius, which then remitted the entire money for acquired Grosvenor Hotel. But that's where India's Axis Bank comes on the ED's radar, because the money was remitted through Axis. ED alleges that Axis did not do due diligence on the source of money. ED also alleges that Axis did not follow the Know Your Customer norms for Sahara. Axis Bank has confirmed receiving a questionnaire from ED to ET now. And in its defense, Axis has said that the transaction in question was undertaken for an existing KYC compliant customer of the bank after ensuring strict compliance of relevant rules and regulations. In fact, in its preliminary report, the Enforcement Directorate suggests that during the last one year, Sahara India Group has collected around 20,000 crore rupees from the public through its various schemes and is now planning various acquisitions overseas to transfer this money abroad. The Enforcement Directorate is leaving no stone unturned in its alleged money laundering probe. It's already in touch with various agencies. Suchetna Ray, ET Now, New Delhi. Let's stay with that big breaking story. We've got Suchetna Ray broke that story earlier today, joining us live from New Delhi. Suchetna, what really is Sahara's response to this entire controversy? They've been saying that the ED has not approached them yet, but what are you picking up from sources in Sahara? 
Sandeep, I spoke to top sources in the Enforcement Directorate and they tell us that it is correct that they've not got in touch with Sahara so far simply because there are three other cases that are open with the Enforcement Directorate with, about the same company. Sahara India Group has been approached uh, in three separate matters including money laundering and also FEMA violations and, that, and this will be clubbed with all the, uh, the existing um, investigations and that is why they've not been con contacted so far. But Enforcement Directorate sources also tell us that since their hunch is that, uh, that uh, foreign acquisitions is the way that Sahara will be um, rooting money out of India. So therefore they think that any acquisition that Sahara India Group now makes abroad should be under the Enforcement Directorate scanner. Obviously we spoke to uh, Sahara India Group as well who has denied this story in spite of the due diligence that ET now has done. In fact in their uh, clarification they say that this is the Enforcement Directorate's personal vendetta against the Sahara Group and therefore these stories are making uh, uh, their way into the media. They also say Said the outward transaction for the Grosvenor deal was done by Ambi Valley Limited, and there are no FEMA uh, violations when it comes to this deal. They also mention that um, uh, SIRECL, which is the Sahara India Real Estate Corporation Limited, is is being probed by SEBI, but Ambi Valley is not under the radar of any regulator, so there are no violations when it comes to the deal. But we assure our viewers that we have done our due diligence and we have uh, we are privy to documents which shows that investment director is indeed looking into this entire deal. So Chetna Re, with those documents, with that story, bringing it for you, our viewers, and in detail. Well, that is uh, Sahara Sources speaking to Suchetna as well. Well, let's move now to succession planning. There are plenty of stories out there. Christine Lagarde, France's finance minister, has officially launched a campaign to succeed Dominic Strauss-Kahn as the head of the International Monetary Fund. That's right, Lagarde is strongly favored to get that job, uh, even though the IMF has said that its board will shortlist three candidates and reach a decision on who its next boss will be by the 30th of June. She's seen as the favorite for the job, and now French Finance Minister Christine Lagarde has launched her bid to become the next head of the International Monetary Fund. C'est un immense défi que j'aborde avec beaucoup d'humilité. It's a huge challenge that I'm undertaking with a great deal of humility and in the hope of receiving the greatest consensus. During the past few months, no zone has been spared from the consequences of the financial and economic crisis. Indeed, even the zones which we believe to be the most solid. If I was elected, I'd bring to the fund all my experience as a lawyer, a manager of business, a minister and a woman. Despite only just formally announcing her candidacy, Lagarde already appears to have enough support in Europe, the United States and China to defeat any potential challengers. Europeans have occupied the managing director role at the IMF since it was set up in 1945, and some of the big emerging economies are criticizing this tradition. All of them, Brazil, Russia, China, India and South Africa, certainly want Europe's grip on the IMF to be loosened and Dominique Strauss-Kahn's successor to be chosen for their competence, not nationality. But the BRICS haven't suggested their own candidate and some emerging market government officials have privately said they couldn't put forward a challenger to compete with Lagarde. Mexico has nominated the head of its central bank, Augustin Carstens. He told Reuters his bid has been well received and he hopes to win support from the authorities in both developed and developing nations. They want to evaluate uh, my uh, CV with respect to the ones uh, in my experience and, and, and so on and my skills with respect to others. That's what I would expect as part of a merit-based process. Meeting at the OECD in Paris, Mexico's finance minister said they believe that both Lagarde and Carstens have good credentials for the job. South Africa and Kazakhstan may also put forward their own candidates. A growing concern about Lagarde's bid is a possible legal probe of her role in a payout to a prominent French businessman in 2008 to settle a dispute with a state-owned bank. Judges will rule by June the 10th whether to launch an inquiry into the matter the same date by which the IMF needs all nominations. The IMF's board will then draw up a shortlist of three candidates and must choose one by June the 30th. Joanna Partridge, Reuters. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh today uh, said that the developing countries should be together in the attempt to reform global financial institutions like the IMF. He said, and I quote, we have to recognize that international relations are power relations and those in power do not wish to yield ground easily. That's uh, the first official comment coming in from the PM on the fight for the IMF top job.
We're keeping it here with the big succession stories, and this one is back in the headlines. Kuranshu Jain's chances to lead Deutsche Bank actually brighten. Is he a key contender? According to the latest reports coming in from the Financial Times, Deutsche Bank is looking to bring in a core CEO model for succession and the two CEOs are likely to succeed Josef Ackerman who actually retires in 2013 but is hugely expected to make an early exit. So who are the two CEOs? Global agencies report that Deutsche Chairman Clement Borzek could look at for a co-head, a co-head who needn't be a banker because Anshu Jain is already in contention performing the banker's job, bringing in 85% of the revenues at Deutsche Bank. The contenders list is interesting because it has a more recent hire at Deutsche last two years as CFO Stefan Cross and Anshu Jain of course remains there for some time. The chief risk officer Hugo Banziger is also very much in there. Sandeep. All right, we've got an expert uh, joining us on this big story. Bundeep Singh Rangar, chairman of uh, Indus View, joins us on the phone line uh, live from uh, London. Uh, Bundeep, how do you see this model working of a co-CEO with Anshu Jain as one of them? Uh, how do you see that uh, moving forward? Hi, thanks. I guess it's interesting. It sort of reminds me of what just stated Infosys, right? You've got an insider and then you've got an outsider brought in. And in some ways, that's the model here. You've got Anshu Jain, who is certainly a Deutsche Bank insider, but not the most well-connected person within uh, sort of the German establishment, um, and also does not speak German, which is probably a requirement to satisfy the German stakeholders. So you match him with an outsider, but keep it uh, politically neutral by not getting another banker who may have a different vision of how things are run. Right, but at, it... um, you know, if I may just bring in a subject that has been raised by uh, nearly 20 pension funds who form a consortium and they continue to advise Deutsche Bank on their various uh, management issues. Now, this consortium has told Financial Times that the delay in succession is not only going to hurt the bank, it's hurting the potential internal candidates. I'm guessing they're referring to, you know, people like Anshu Jen. What do you make out of that? Hurting, I mean, any delay is hurting the process. Absolutely. I guess that's the firm you're referring to, and they are an activist shareholder, and they certainly uh, have taken other German companies to task before when it comes to management governance. I mean, remember, Joseph Ackerman was supposed to step down last year. He extended this to 2013 in the absence of a suitable successor. And the challenge here is that if Anshu Jen is not elevated to a, in this case, seems like a co-CEO role, he will simply leave, right? He's a person who's driving the highest uh, profitable unit of the bank. And if you look at HSBC and Barclays, they've brought in former investment banking people to head up the main commercial retail banking side. So there's certainly a case for uh, making sure that Anshu Jain's ambitions are met within Deutsche Bank, but maybe this model of cohabitation with someone who has got an extensive German business network outside of the banking world is one where there's a nice, happy compromise and a nice solution. Okay, Bandeep, appreciate your joining us. A quick recap of what really was said was essentially that, you know, this pension, group, pension fund group has suggested that any delay in the succession plan would actually make it hard for internal candidates to stick around. If officially written, according to Financial Times, to the Deutsche Board. Well, quick reminder on where Wall Street is at the moment. The Dow has been under pressure, very topsy-turvy, and currently just about flirting with being in the red or green making up its mind. NASDAQ very much so is also highly uncertain. All right, let's uh, turn to the markets here. The Dow Street uh, was uh, down in trade for the third straight session. Markets ended the day with uh, sharp losses. Sensex lost 165 points, while the Nifty shot below the 53.50 mark. Capital goods and IT stocks uh, were the laggards in trade. Asha Faridi with a wrap of the day's trade. Absolutely no respite uh, visible for the market after the kind of crackdown that we saw below 5400. And again, today was another pivot point day when we broke below the 5350 odd level as well. Finally, closing in at that 5348 odd mark on closing bell. The Nifty, in fact, has made another 12 week low, and the selling clearly continues to fail, or rather, the selling uh, continues to show you any signs of a slowdown kick in. BSE, IT, and Infosys now are in key limelight because they have given in very serious breakdowns and they're now staring at below uh, March 11 lows. Uh, not just that, the patterns only show that there may be further cuts in space for the entire IT universe. So IT clearly was the talking point in trade today. Not just that, 
you know, we are seeing the rollovers as well skewed on the sell side. And most traders are now talking about 53.30 being a very crucial support level and as to how the index must actually hold on to it for us to see any recovery. Come tomorrow, of course, we would be staring at expiries to get set for more fireworks only in place. And the negative clearly seems to be on uh, acute downside as of now. Be